Um, so we want to give everyone a chance to just kind of come on. I want to go through and make sure I um, thank Miss Sandy and Uwe for helping us tonight. Um, Uwe is magnificent when it comes down to the technology. We want to thank him. We want to also thank Oni. And Oni, I don't know if you are on right now. Um, but if you are, you want to say hey to everyone, you can. Go ahead and unmute and say hey. I don't know who else is on. Oh, that's Uwe that's on. Well, we'll give everyone a chance to um, get on. We want to um, thank you guys for joining us and congratulations on making it to um, the opening of Virginia. So <laughs> a slight opening, I would say. Congratulations for making it. We hope you guys remain um, intact and sane and Okay, um, let's see, who do we have? We just had someone to join. Oh no, someone commented. I'm still getting used to Zoom, guys. Don't, um, don't worry. Oh, okay. All right, Uwe, if you can let me know um, how many people have joined so I can go ahead and move on because unfortunately I cannot see and I don't want to delay okay. too long. All right. Um, you can kind of just coach me through the Facebook Live right now. Um, how's yeah. everyone on the call tonight? Is everyone doing okay? That is great. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. All right, Chuck, how are you doing? We have not heard from you in a while. All right, Chuck says he is doing great. I don't know if everyone can see that. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and move into um, thanking everyone. Um, you guys know that we love you guys so much. We want to thank our members. Um, our members are still joining and tacking on uh, with us. They are joining our meetings, any meetings that we have, they're still supporting us. We want to thank you guys so much. Um, it, I, we have saw... Um, so many groups just kind of, you know, you know, mellow out because, um, you know, the everything like technology is new for everyone. If we hadn't had, we, I don't know where we would be. Um, but we want to thank you guys for continuing to follow us. Um, we do not always have our um, our internet meetings 100%, but you guys still stick with us. So we want to thank you guys so much. Um, we will be having a June meeting. I, uh, we kind of last minute made this, we were going to do something else for our June meeting, but um, since COVID happened, happened to us and we have to social distance, we're going to go ahead and um, do us a virtual meeting and our meeting will completely be catered to our community. We want to hear from you guys. We want to know um, what you guys experienced throughout this pandemic. If you guys learned anything, um, we want to see how you guys came out on the other side. We want to hope that you guys are not the same in your business, that your business is actually booming better now than ever. If you guys would like to share with us, um, we're going to put you on Zoom. We're going to put you on our live meetings. People are going to see your face and people are going to know your name after that meeting. If you guys would like to share, we want you to go to www.chesterfieldria.com and sign up for us. Um, of course, we're going to have an order of everyone who will be presenting. So um, we want to make sure we have, uh, and we do have a limit. Um, right now, I cannot think of the limit off the top of my head. But of course, we do not want to have 50 people present at night because we'll be all night but if you guys do want to share with us um we want to invite you guys to, to sign up and that's www.chesterfieldria.com um tonight's meeting is also catered to you guys but we want to make sure you guys are maximizing your profits on your rental property. So we do have some really great content tonight as well. We want to make sure you guys join in. Take notes, get a notepad, make sure you guys take as many notes as you can because we do have some really great people. Um, but before we get into the meeting, I want to go ahead and run over our sponsors as well. And we're going to put our sponsors up on the screen so you guys can know and take their information down. All right, um, and we will just go ahead and start, of course, um, with 
creative realty and of course i work with creative realty i do not want to be um biased to you guys but creative realty is very it's we're great um there is a number if you guys want to sell homes um in the state of virginia you go and you get your license you want to go ahead and call creative realty join us um i'm not biased we do have some of the best people on our team um and these people are willing to teach you all the ropes and um, we move forward together um we also have richmond mortgage Mr. Mike Crumbine. Um, you guys have probably worked with um, Mike before. Mike is a hard money lender. Um, if you have not heard of Mike, please go and get to know him, even if you need him in the future. Mike is great. Um, his contact information is at the bottom of the screen. If you guys do not have it, it's pretty easy to look him up on Facebook. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and say the number out because it's kind of small. It's 804 240 nine three one four make sure you give mike a call he's great as well we also have miss tammy squires at cambridge title she closes everything guys and when i say everything everything no matter what's on the title tammy can get us to the closing table she just got us um out of a really hard deal a few weeks ago this the craziest deal only can tell you about it um and she she just got us to the closing table so um, we want to make sure you guys are following up with Tammy. She was on the line. We're going to try to get her on the line again. She is now doing um, online signings, recordings, and things of that nature. So um, Tammy is really good. Check her out. We also have Victory Theater. And we cannot go into the theater right now, but when they do open up, Chesterfield RIA members get 20% off if you use the code CREIA. Um, they do have up to date movies. You guys want to go ahead and check them out. Their event space is magnificent. Now, you guys do not get 20% off the, make, uh, the event space, but you can get 20% off your codes. But their event spaces, I mean, you guys saw it, it's, it's great. All right, so we're going to, uh, those are our four sponsors. If you guys want to be a sponsor, you can contact us at 804-269-0255. Um, you do get benefits for being a sponsor. Of course, um, we shout you out, so to speak. And if, um, if you guys become a sponsor, you get so many different benefits. Um, and of course, you are on our list to, um, you know, you become a recommendation of ours, the first recommendation. All right, so we're going to go ahead and move right into the meeting. Again, our meeting is about maximizing our rental properties. Um, we have a lot of people who um, don't, they have a lot of questions about management and things of this nature, of, of that nature. We literally would do like the exit surveys you guys know of, and a lot of people would reach out to us about how do we maximize profits on our rental properties and how do we manage them so we have two of the best property managers in richmond you guys actually see their signs everywhere um we're gonna go ahead and start with mr Kyle. he has um mr bill on the line with him so uh, we're gonna have them introduce themselves now all right so um my name is kyle stevenson i am gonna do a presentation that I usually do in about an hour and 15 minutes. So we're gonna fly through it, but the goal of this is to hopefully inspire everyone to just focus on real estate. It's the best investment in the whole wide world. And it can take, uh, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the equalizer. It allows people that don't make a lot of money to leverage themselves and put themselves, if they, if they do all of the right math and do all of the right things um and they're patient um they can uh they can make a bunch of money so um and then i got bill lee who's gonna help me because i'm not super duper at technology stuff so um bill works with me he's just gonna keep me uh, keep me focused for the next 15 minutes so real estate so fdr um who actually uh, was a president uh, during some pretty hard times, just like some you know hard times you get going through right now. Says real estate cannot be lost or stolen, nor can it be carried away. Purchase with common sense, 
paid for in full and managed with reasonable care. It's about the safest investment in the whole wide world. And that's, uh, that's what I believe. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's been part of my life for, um, uh, since I got out of school. So a little bit about myself. So I'm getting old. Um, it's really scary, but uh, I'm getting a little bit old. So, um, uh, so I've been dealing and buying uh, in uh, real estate for the past 30 years. Um, you know, just over time, you know, I've been able to uh, you know, build a multi-million dollar portfolio for myself. And I am not super, I mean, there's nothing really too fancy about myself. Um, uh, I've been investing since the 90s. Um, uh, went to Penn, which, which admittedly was a really good school. So that helped me to uh, get kind of the ball rolling and understanding other people's goals. Um, I sold medical equipment for a while. It wasn't a slouch job. I did make good money, but I had to sell. And then I was able to take that money and buy a, a bunch of real estate. I left corporate America in 2006 and just pursued real estate full time. Um, we manage over, uh, uh, over, um, 3000, uh, units over and, uh, with about 500 clients. Um, and I want to say, I got a little, um, bear with me guys. I'm going to print something so I don't miss, um, miss anything, but, um, a little bit more about myself is I, um, you know, my, my parents, you know, my mom was a school teacher. My dad worked for the state for several years, or I say for several years, for his, for the time he was in the, uh, the U.S. He was originally from Jamaica, so my, uh, my father was an immigrant. I did play football at Penn, um, but um, again, um, you know, I didn't come from some sort of ridiculously extravagant uh, world. Um, Bill, you want to kind of keep it going so we... All right, so the, the biggest thing that I wanna talk about today is just starting with a little bit of dough and having it um, to compound upon itself. I think the best way to do this is, um, is to buy single family homes and there's a reason why. So why do I like single family homes as a starting point? Um, I like it because you can scale it and, it and you don't need a lot of money to start. You can um, start with, you know, 5,000 bucks or less. I know Oni actually has some great ideas how to, how to start with probably no money down. Um, it's stable. If you buy the right property and you get the right tenant in that property, they will stay there year after year. It's, um, it, it's more static. Uh, meaning there's not a lot of change when you buy that single family home. It's not as dynamic. Um, again, we talked a little bit about leverage. And the number four thing, which, um, which I talk about in, in certain seminars, is something called disproportionate appreciation. And disproportionate appreciation is you're going to be able to buy a home, sometimes in difficult times or in an up and coming neighborhood. And at some point, the appreciation on it, instead of it being this rental property, it's going to be a property that an owner is going to want to buy. And that will give you a disproportionate level of appreciation. And that's where you can generate a lot of wealth. Next. So appreciation. So we'll, we'll talk about it uh, again, just for a couple seconds. When you, when you rent a property, you're going to get a certain return, you know, a few hundred dollars a month, maybe off that property. But, but when somebody wants to own it, okay, it doesn't matter what the rental price is. And so sometimes it's rate dependent, you know, so rates are at an all time low. So we've heard a lot about people talking about, um, about single family homes, not being that difficult to sell right now. That's because the cost of ownership uh, the cost of borrowing money is very low. So that means that you're going to get more appreciation than you otherwise would. That's where you get wealth. Okay. That's where you can really cash in on your chips. Um, so a lot of people think commercial real estate is sexy. You know, 
Um, a shopping mall is sexy. And single family homes, again, simple. Uh, keep it simple in the beginning. Um, commercial real estate, whether it's apartment buildings or, um, or, or stores, you, you, you have to worry about long leases. And long-term leases a lot of times lead to long-term vacancy. Um, so there's a lot of, again, um, I, I call it, there's this dynamic piece that becomes a little bit stressful if you're an entry-level investor. So I am not a big fan uh, of getting into single family home or getting into commercial real estate right out of the box. I, I think a great way to start are single family homes. Next. So what do I believe are the variables we should look, look at when, uh, when buying a single family home? I, I'm sure everybody on this phone call or on this um, presentation knows, first thing about real estate, location, location, location. I am a big believer for single family homes to buy in, um, to, to buy in the counties. And the reason is if you live in the city and you're a family, your dream is to go to the Mecca. And the Mecca is Henrico County, Chesterfield County. It's not Petersburg. I'm not saying I, I got into it with someone got angry at me. That there aren't a lot of families that want Petersburg to be their destination. And the reason being it's the school system. So I'm not against Petersburg. I don't, I'm not a Petersburg hater. I'm just saying that most families would opt to have their families go to a place where they feel there's a better uh, school system. So I think location is important. Holding period, you need to, you know, the conservative way is to buy at a right price and then to hold it until it's time for someone who really wants to own that property. You rent it out and then um, at some point that, that uh, there's going to be another individual that wants to own it and raise a family in that property. Again, this is what I did. I'm not saying this is for everybody. Um, you want to make sure that that roof has, you know, at least five to 10 years left on it. Because when you get ready to uh, flip it to an owner, you're gonna probably need to do a new roof. Same thing for HVAC. You wanna make sure the exterior has a low cost um, uh, exterior, whether it's brick, vinyl siding, something of that nature. Um, landscaping, you don't need a bunch of land. A bunch of land means a bunch of costs. So if you can have, you know, that small rancher uh, that doesn't have a lot of land, that, you know, that works. The electrical system, there's no value. There's no value in upgrading an electrical system, you know. So you want to hopefully have an upgraded electrical system when you, when you purchase the home. Um, and then interior, you don't need a monster home. You want a home somewhere between 12, 1800 square feet. You don't want to have to turn it and spend a bunch of money turning it because the rents on a 12 to 1800 square foot home aren't going to be um, linearly different than something that's 3600, you know, if that makes sense. So I'm not, if I'm renting one home for $1,500, it doesn't mean I'm going to get $3,000 a month for something twice the amount. So this is kind of what I would look at, like, look at when I'm trying to buy a home. So I'm going to give you some examples. So, and, and these, I, I, I picked some examples of things that I've done, okay, and um, and uh, and that I can share with you. So, um, so on the last big market, I believe it was the last big market, about 10, 10 12 years ago now, I bought 8516 Bent Ridge Lane, bought it for $175,000. It's a three bedroom, one and a half bath. It's in Freeman School District, rents for $1,495 a month. Um, so I, I, I want to keep this home. If you take a look at it, there's some things that, that were pretty beat up on it that I had to take care of. So we talk about the roof, you know, there's some investments I made because I want to keep it for a long time. So next slide, I think we're good. So I ended up, all right, it had some siding. So I ended up painting the siding, 
put on some shutters. I had to put on a new roof. So these are the things that I don't necessarily want to do, but I had to do with this home. Um, I'm not advising to do this, but I've, I've been doing it for a while. So I had some money, so I did it. And then the same thing with, uh, you know, you fix up the landscaping. And then I would say, you know, one of the things that we do with, um, with a lot of the properties is try to create some scalability. So um, if you like backsplashes, pick a backsplash you're going to use for most properties. Use the same Formica countertop. Use the same cabinets. Don't, don't try to, to change, um, you know, change the, the, the world. Just this is, this is a business that you're creating. How am I, how am I doing on time? All right. uh, you're great. All right. Okay. Um, here's another property. So this is, so I love Sanson. I love Eastern Henrico. So this is 233 Defense Avenue. So it's a four bedroom, one bath. Again, bought it, not in a great time, you know, but still, still did fine. Uh, fixed it up a little bit. And, you know, we rent it for $930. It's not sexy. I want to show you guys these things because people will live in these homes because it's Sanson, it's Eastern Henrico, but they will live in these homes. I've had two tenants in, I want to say 14 years. So that's what you want. Um, so keep going, Billy. So that was what it used to look like. I don't know if we even have a, so I was just showing you it was a simple home. There was nothing sexy to it. So, um, so how do you get started? Uh, try to understand the rent of the property, work with a real estate agent, um, understand Zillow, knock, knock on doors around neighborhoods that you're, you're interested in and ask people whether they rent or own and ask them how much they're paying for rent. Um, I mean, that's, don't, you, you want to substantiate what everybody, you know, what, what other people also are telling you, okay? Buy with the numbers. Try, try not to just get excited with your eyes. Owners, people who want to own and live in a home, get excited, all right? You're a real estate investor. You need to buy with the numbers. So if the rent doesn't work, don't buy the home. If the rent doesn't cover that mortgage, don't do not buy. That's that's a that's a that's a bad bad mistake. Okay, keep going. And so let me before before I go into this stuff, just we, we skipped a lot of the number stuff, guys, because it, it takes a long time to go through. But just just understand that if you're putting some money down and you look at the mortgage, don't in your head say, oh, I can get $200 more a month when nobody on that block pays, you know, if, if the rent on the block is $1,000, your home's not renting for 1200 bucks. So don't fool yourself by making, don't, don't squeeze the numbers. You know, it's kind of buying a shoe that's too small, thinking your foot's going to feel comfortable in the shoe. Don't do it. Okay. Make sure those numbers work or you're going to pay for it years to come. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about this story, guys, because this is this is well, it's one of my favorite stories. Okay, this was the first deal I did. You can pull it up. It's 142 Patterson Avenue in Patterson, New Jersey. I made all of the mistakes on this thing. I, I think it looks. I think we took this off of what it looks like now. Okay, I don't own it anymore. So I bought this property, and I'm I'm originally from New Jersey. I tell everybody. When you are from New Jersey, okay, nobody has any compassion on you. If you are a sucker, okay, and you got a big S on your head, they will take advantage of you. And that was my experience here. So, um, so I had a guy who, um, who sold me this. His name's Gene Lowe. I still remember him, okay? And I walked up to the second floor of the house, and there was nothing but um, joist. So there was no subflooring. Okay. And I said, I said, well, how am I going to rent this out? And the, and the guy said, he goes, oh, Kyle, he goes, don't worry about it. He says the tenants in this neighborhood, they bring their own sub flooring. You don't need to worry about it. All right. So long. And I'm like, all right, great. Duke's laughing at me, man. I'm telling you, brother, it was real. So I'm thinking, 
I'm thinking, great. So long story short, I was the sucker. I bought this thing for 128. I had to have my father help me get this thing into, into rentable shape, which it still doesn't look like it's in rentable shape. I made every mistake under the sun. And I still, 12 years later, I bought in 1991. I bought it. I, I was able to sell it, okay, in 2003. And I netted about $60,000 off this deal. And this was screwing everything up. So what was I able to do? Keep going. All right. This looks a lot better if you drive by it today. But this is 3211, 3209, 3211 Elwood Avenue. So I own these, all right? And I bought them many, many moons ago. Um, what happened? Go back. Anyway, so I bought those many moons ago. I took... So I didn't tell you this part. So I took that one, that, that 142 Patterson Avenue. That was a $3,000 investment because the guy held a second. I was able to take that. That turned into $60,000. And then I was able to 1031 into these deals. All right. Anybody that knows any, these are Elwood Avenue. It's in Carytown. Okay. It was a six. It was, so that 3,000 ended up getting me these quads. If there's anybody who knows about Carrytown, um, even though these don't look good in these pictures, I, they're, 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 worth a, a, they're worth a substantial amount of money. So it's being patient and, you know, making sure the numbers work and buying the right deal. And, you know, that $3,000 turns into stuff that's in a pretty hot area. All right, keep going. All right, so... Here is an example of disproportionate. I, I swear I'm almost done. I bet you I'm at 20 minutes. Am I at 20 minutes? I'm almost done. Can I, can I get five more minutes? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I thought I could do it. Okay. So 501 Langhorn. Um, this is in, this is over by the racetrack. <laughs> 2007. You know about 501? <laughs> All right. So. Um, this is over by the racetrack. Bought it in 2007 for $45,000. It was Henrico County, and I knew at some point in Henrico County, people would flock to it. So I rented it out for 10 years, rented it to the same guy, okay? And, um, and it's not sexy looking here. Rented it for $800. This is the old picture, missing a shutter. It was rough, okay? Um, but then came disproportionate appreciation. People wanted to own in Henrico County. So we were able to take that $45,000. Admitted, admittedly, I think I put $25,000 into it. We ended up being able to sell it for one fifty. dollars You want to show what it looked like, Bill? So again, what did we do? Ah, go back one second. So what did we do? Uh, we power washed it, okay, because it was brick. Um, we put on shutters. It's the same blue shutters you saw earlier. It's the same roof you saw earlier. It's the same landscaping you saw you saw earlier. Um, and then go inside. We refinished the hardwood floors. We we stage everything the same. You can look at the backsplash. You can look at the cabinets, the light fixtures. Everything's the same. Nothing changes. Keep going. And then I, I want to share this and then we're going to, we'll, we'll cut it off because I know that I'm over my time. Um, I was able to take the money from that home. Okay. And then this was a deal at 2301 Barton that I believe I bought for 225. I'm pretty sure that's what I bought it for. And, and actually I rent it for more, more than that, over 4,000 a month now, but I was able to 1031 that that Langhorn deal into this. And we rehabbed it. If you drive by it now, there are great roses out and we redid the doors and some shutters and the roof. And so it looks a little bit different, but um, this is what you're able to do with disproportionate appreciation. And um, it's not, I'm not fancy. I mean, this is really kind of gritty, nothing sexy. It's basic you know, safe, clean, affordable housing, but it's made a really big difference for me. 
and I think for the people that uh, that live in these properties, and uh, it's been a good run. So I wanted to share that with everybody. Um, hopefully, this you know was able to touch your lives, and if I guess you have any questions, I'm more than happy to help them. And Bill, we'll just cut it now. All right. So before you go, Kyle, I just want to open the floor up for a few questions. Anybody have any questions they want to ask? If you're on the line, I do have one. So, but I'll wait. To I, I got a question one. for Kyle. Um, awesome, so, Kyle, that Langhorn is a good example. So, you bought the house cheap, <clears throat> held it for was it ten years? You held it about ten years. And so, do you have a uh, what's your system for deciding when to sell? Like, uh, you could have held that on, held that for another. Is, is there any tax consequences you're thinking about, or is it when the market's hot, you take some chips off the table, or what are your thoughts on when you sell? Yep. So, when the market, so what I try to do is when the market is is a little bit rough um, and people are struggling. So I, I mean, I, I hope there's some people that I shouldn't say, I hope, I think there'll be some people that are struggling over the next year. All right. I'll be there to help them out. You know, banks start to tighten up their money. And so, um, so we'll be opportunistic and we'll look at opportunity. We think over the next year. And then when the market gets hot, I'm a, I'm a seller and I like the 1031, but I'm not a big seller. I like, I, I, I don't, I'm not an easy seller or I'll refinance. But for a single family home, you'll never get those returns that you would as an investor. Multifamily is a little bit different, but single family, when, when ownership in a neighborhood just goes bonkers, and I was renting in that neighborhood, it's, 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 it's time to go because you'll never get, you know, the return that you'll get in a hot market, you know, whether it's Sandston, whether it's, you know, just kind of that, especially that Eastern Henrico or West End. I mean, you just don't get those returns. So that's what I do. And then I, and then, and then I like to trade up, trade up into a multifamily, something that's going to throw off some cash. And that's been my formula my whole life. Um, do we have any other questions? Hey, I have a question. Trevor, I saw you. I saw it, man. You look good, man. <laughs> hey, I'm good, Kyle. How are you? I'm, I'm living living the life, baby. Uh, I know you are. Hey, what's the best way to set up a 1031 exchange and then manage it? So I used to just use a um, – so I'll tell you what. There's a guy by the name of Bill Bean. And I, know, I know Bill. So he can do it for you, and they don't charge you a nickel. Where is he, he at now? He's at VCB, Virginia – Commonwealth or community okay. VCB, whatever VCB is, pull up Bill B and VCB. <laughs> All right, I'm um, and, and, and he's very reasonable. There's a, another company they charge you like 700 bucks, but I think Bill may even do it for like nothing. Good okay. guy. Yep. And, and I still have that property, Kyle. You, you still you still holding on to it? I'm still holding on. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Is it, is it, is it, is it, has the tenant been good? Well, it, it, it's my stepdad. Um, okay. <laughs> my mother passed last year, so I inherited him. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Okay, well. Yeah, so, I mean, he takes care of it. He does everything. I've been trying to get him to take it over and buy it, but he doesn't want that responsibility. Okay. You're still, you're Capital One, is that where you were? Yeah, I'm, I'm, there, I'm still there for now, but things okay. have. The, the, the real estate side has really picked up after over well, the good. last couple of years. Okay. Well, good for you. All right. So do we have any other questions? <clears throat> Anyone else? All right. So I do have one myself before you go. So you say that the um, multifamily um, you showed on Barton Heights, it wasn't, you know, eye candy so to speak right. um with those properties just say that you take over those properties and you have one where e either there's no tenant like it's vacant or one that it's you know it's totally it's bad you know uh -huh. and you have to go in and fix up how like what would you do in those situations where so, you're buying a multi-family yep yeah, so i have a plan so in, in that and, and everything you gotta you gotta look at everything differently but you know, my, my mission also is to provide clean, safe, affordable housing. So in this case, there were some old people that lived in that house, that lived in those units 
And some of those people were just, I mean, it was garbage. So, but, but they paid rent on a timely basis. So we got, you know, we, we kind of came up with, hey, if the place looked really good, what could you afford? And so we ended up, there were a couple of deadbeats. And so we evicted them. And then what we did is we started to transfer people that were really good. You know, the, the woman who had lived in that, her apartment for like 20 years, but was willing to pay, you know, another $200 a month for something nice. And so we transfer, we'd fix it up and then we would transfer her. And then we fixed another one up and we transfer another tenant. And then we put in a couple other good tenants. And, you know, what would I do? We'd put in a new bath. We'd redo the plumbing. We'd put in a kitchen. I love, I love washer dryers. If you can get them into homes like those, I love washer dryers. I love washer dryer stackables, whatever you can do, because a lot of people in those types of neighborhoods or in those types of properties have never had a washer dryer. They always have to go to the laundromat. So you do that. I mean, you're, you know, they'll, they'll stay there. They'll sign a three-year lease for you you know, with you and they're eternally grateful. So that's really been what we've done. So we put in a new kitchen. I, pu I put in a backsplash on everything. I call it, this is, this is real inappropriate, but I'm, I'm going to share it with you anyway. I call it crack splash because it's almost like crack. It attracts you to it. And you just, you, you love it. <laughs> so it's, Duke's it's like, oh my though. God. <laughs> so anyway, so. It's actually true. Uh, it is, right? Right, you like it. So anyway, so we put in the backsplash, we put in a washer dryer, we put in a new kitchen, uh, redo the floors, redo the plumbing, put in some nice tile. So I, I like putting in nice tile for the bathroom, rent it for the right price, don't bend anybody over, and they don't leave, and you're good. That, that's, what I, that's what I do. So if you, did, if you drive by that property also, I like landscaping, so I love roses. So I put roses throughout the property, make sure I spend money on making sure, you know, you know, I don't, I, I, the landscaper, make sure he's out there every week, cleans up trash, hard edges, mulch beds. So it looks tight. So they, they, that, that property, the exterior or those, that landscaping is just as nice as if you go to Short Pump Mall. That's, that's what I would do on my stuff. Did that's that great. Help? Yep, it does a lot. You like that, you, you like that crack splash? I do. I love flash. I, I, I call it backsplash. I'm going to go ahead and stick with mine. No, but I do. I love it. I love it. I love it. Even All right. Good. Um, but we want to thank you so much for your presentation. It was thank very um, good information. It was very helpful. I, myself, um, personally, I'm trying my best to get into multifamily. Um, we want to go ahead and invite you to give any contact information so anyone can contact you if that's your thing. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, <laughs> send it, I'll send it to you and then whoever can get it. <clears throat> perfect right. perfect um well we thank you again we really appreciate right. your information um we're gonna go ahead at this time and turn the floor over to mr duke dodson um with Do dodson properties you see his signs everywhere so you can't miss them and you finally get to meet the infamous mr <clears throat> dodson <laughs> <laughs> well thanks for having me guys it's kyle stevenson's a hard act to follow i've been uh friends and buddies and competitors with kyle for a long time and Kyle, hearing you talk, I knew some of that stuff, but I didn't know all of it. It's amazing how, how much we have in common as far as our stories. Like, so my mom was a school teacher. I played, co played college football, started my property management business in 2007, one year after you. Uh, investing in rental properties is what got me into the business, just like you, uh, and get, got me into the property management business. And my first uh, couple investments I made were, were dogs as well. I, you know, took my lumps. And my first properties I bought were 2005 and six and seven. And not only were they a bad deal then, they got really bad in 07, 8, 9 when the market turned. And literally, you know, those, those, those were hard lessons because I had to hold on to those things for about, you know, 12, 13 years before I could get out from underneath them. And so nothing teaches you lessons like pain. <laughs> you know, like your, your story about the house with no floors, you know, my first property, man, I bought it from this a duplex with this lady, 2914 Haynes Avenue. You know, I made all the classic mistakes, uh, paid too much. Um, didn't understand the rehab costs, didn't rehab it properly, you know, under, I under rehabbed it. Um, I didn't have a really good contract. Uh, <clears throat> so when we came to the closing table, all of a sudden all these closing costs that I assume were hers got thrown onto my side. And, you know, what did I know? I was a st stupid kid. So, but, you know, I learned, like I always joked and said, those three, those first three properties that I bought, um, even though they were quote unquote bad investments, 
uh, I never would have bought the next 10 if I hadn't learned those lessons. So I don't, I don't regret them, even though they were painful. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have got to where I am if I hadn't gone through those. If I had had analysis paralysis and never bought those first three, I never would have bought the next 10. So um, in 2007, I started my company called Dotson Property Management. <clears throat> At the time, we just managed single family homes <clears throat> for myself and mostly for others, mostly third party. And as we grew, we added multifamily and commercial. We now manage associations as well. Um, but the, the investment side, the development side is what got me into the business. And that's my favorite part. Uh, I do like the management side. Um, learning property management from the ground up, kind of teaching myself the game step by step uh, was a great education in real estate because no matter what you buy, no matter how good a deal you think you have bought, it's not worth anything if you don't manage it well over time. Um, you know, if you let uh, expenses creep, if you don't, uh, if you don't maximize revenue, you'll never make any money on it. But if you do the management side well, not only can you make money, but you can improve the value of that property over time, just, just as Kyle kind of outlined there. Um, you, you know, they gave us some bullet points to cover, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of fill in this, the blanks that Kyle, you know, didn't cover, um, but I'm happy to take questions as well. Um, I mean, some of the best advice I can give when you're buying rental properties and managing them, you know, if you haven't read any of the, the Robert Kiyosaki books, those are great starter books to get you started thinking like a real estate investor. And some of his lessons, uh, even though they were simple, it, they seem they really stuck with me over the years. Uh, his uh, two things he always talked about. Number one is uh, uh, look at a hundred deals and buy one. Don't look at three deals and buy one. Um, when you're getting to the real estate game, you're so eager to buy a property that you, I looked at three and I bought the best of those three, right? Um, but if you look at a hundred deals, not only w the one that you find will be a better deal because it's one out of a hundred. Um, uh, the, the, the exercise and the discipline of going through those hundred deals, you'll learn so much that you'll be able to spot the deal so fast. Uh, you know, you, if you look at a hundred deals and I don't expect you to look at hundred deals every time, but if you do that early on, you'll spot those deals so much faster, um, uh, because you can properly assess the rent. You can properly assess the rehab costs. You can, uh, assess what your expenses are going to be. You can start to see that, oh, this doesn't look right. You know? these 99 houses had floors in them. This house doesn't have a floor in them, right? That, you know, you, 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 you see trends like that. Um, so, uh, you know, look at hundred deals by one and then uh, true sub market expertise. And, and Kyle touched on that, right? Like he, the areas he loves, he, he loves those areas because he knows them so well and he knows what they can do. Right. He loves Sanson because he's probably looked at a lot of deals in Sanson. He's probably owned a lot of deals in Sanson. So he knows what they'll rent for. He knows the quality of tenant that you will get. He knows the average length of tenancy. Um, he knows that area, for example, he said this tenant will stay there year after year. That's not true in every neighborhood, but it is true in, in the in the blue collar uh, neighborhoods, the suburban neighborhoods that he mentioned, that is probably true um, because of the school system, um, because the houses aren't too big, they're affordable, um, you know, all those things. But you don't know those things until you really, you spend the time uh, learning. Um, so, you know, I encourage everybody getting into the game early is, even if you're not a finance person, uh, Google uh, how to calculate a cap rate, right? And it can be a very simple calculation. It might be, you know, my first financial model was seven or eight lines. It was very simple. You estimate your income, you estimate your expense. Um, if you don't know what a cap rate is, it just can't, just Google it, figure it out and, and learn it. And then if it, that gives you a basis to compare all the properties against each other. That gives you a good basis to compare apples to oranges. Um, so when you look at 100 deals and you stack them up beside each other, you can literally sort them by cap rate higher, you know, high to low. Um, you know, the, the mistakes that early investors usually make, um, because when you get into the game, normally you are just like Kyle was, just like I was, you short on funds to start. So you usually go to the cheapest neighborhoods, the cheapest rentals, um, because you have the least amount of cash. And it's, it's not that you can't make it in those neighborhoods, it's just gonna be harder. And the, the two things that you'll always underestimate, um, you'll underestimate your vacancy or, or bad debt, you know, and uh, you'll underestimate your maintenance costs and repairs um, because of those two things. You'll have a hard time making uh, any money um, in those neighborhoods. Um, when if you buy a house and you renovate it, and, and you're just not going to get a quality tenant that's going to stay there and pay rent month after month, it's going to be really hard. You know, you do your projections thinking you'll get 12 months of rent, and then you take your vacancy factor out, maybe use seven percent vacancy. But if you if you if you're estimating seven percent vacancy and you really achieve fourteen percent vacancy year over year, you won't make any money. Um, and so to Kyle's point, the neighborhoods where uh, it's more because of the school systems, it's more likely for the tenant to stay there, you know, five years on average or seven years on average as opposed to one year. Um, your vacancy number will be zero for all those years, and that's a that's a big number. 
Um, and then your biggest maintenance costs are going to be on the turn, right? You'll, yes, you'll have a repair here and there. Every, something will break, the HVAC, the fridge, something will break. But your big cost is that turn cost. So not only is it vacant and you're not re receiving income, you're, you're paying, you know, you're not paying $250 for a repair. You're paying $1,500 to clean and paint and repair and, and patch drywall and whatever you're going to do. Um, so I would think about all that. Um, uh, the Robert Kiyosaki books cover this. And I remember the, when the light bulb went off in my head about the power of leverage and Kyle touched on this as well. Um, you know, you, if you've ever read Dave Ramsey, he says the opposite of what I'm getting ready to say. And so you have to read Dave Ramsey and you got to read Robert Kiyosaki and you, you decide who's right. I know who I think is right. But Dave Ramsey would, would say, buy one house, pay it off. Buy, buy the second house, pay it off. Buy the third house. But the only problem with his way of doing it is by the time you buy, pay off the third house, you're dead. Because um, it take, took you 70 years to do that, right? Um, whereas R Robert Kiyosaki explains the power of leverage. And, and, and what he means by that is if, if you're putting 100% down on a house, meaning you're buying it in cash and you have to save up to buy that second one, um, yes, your risk is lower because you have no mortgage payment and that's great. Um, but, but if you have one house, and um, that the market appreciates 7%. So let's just do the math. You have a $100,000 house and the market goes up 7%. Your house went from 100,000 to 107,000. So your net worth increased $7,000. Um, if you buy, instead of buying um, one house with 100% down, if you buy 10 houses with 10% down, that's the same amount of down payment, but now you have 10 houses instead of one. Uh, let's say all those houses are worth $100,000. And now the market goes up 7%. Your, your net worth just went up 7,000 times 10. So your net worth went up $70,000 as opposed to $7,000. Now the trade-off is risk, right? You have 10 mortgage payments. So if things get tough, you have to make those mortgage payments, but you gotta understand the power of leverage. Um, so uh, if you have 10 houses and a lot of them are vacant, you're gonna be in a lot more pain than you have one house and, and one's vacant, but that's the risk you have to decide you're willing to take as a real estate investor. Um, so some of the things they asked us to talk about are effective property management and systems and softwares. And so uh, here's my advice to any newbie. Uh, any newbie, um, I would not encourage you to self-manage. I would encourage you, to, encourage you to hire a quality property manager like Kyle Stevenson or, or, or Duke Dotson um, until you learn the game. And then you, it's up to you to decide then once you learn the best ways to manage properties, you can decide, do I want to spend that time doing that? Or would I rather spend my time doing something else and making money and, and, and paying Kyle and I, the, the peanuts, the nickels that you pay us to manage your rentals. Um, when you get into the game, you don't know what you're doing. You can make some pretty costly mistakes, you know, on the uh, uh, eviction side of the game, um, not understanding the law. You can get yourself into a lot of legal trouble, a lot of liability. Um, so effective property management is first is knowing the rules, knowing the laws, uh, knowing the systems and processes that you need to follow to effectively manage your property. Um, you know, everything in property, man there's nothing in property management that is that difficult to learn. Um, it, none of it's rocket science. Um, but it takes a while to learn those each, uh, we treat each process within the game as a, a process that's important that needs to be tweaked and improved over time. So the process of how you set rents, how do you determine what market rent is the process for marketing your property, the process for screening a tenant, um, rent collection, the software that you use to track rent collection, assess late fees, to print late notices, all of those things, again, very simple. Uh, boiled down once you figure out how to do each of them, but each of them deserves time and attention to do them well. So as a new investor, if you're not willing to take the time to um, create all of those processes and learn them, then you should probably hire a property manager to do those things for. And you pay that person a fee, but they do it correctly, hopefully, and you can learn the process by watching them, them do it. And I know some uh, folks that own 10 or 20 houses, they manage it themselves. They're you know, semi-retired or retired, and that's all they do. And if they, especially if they live close by and they can walk the properties and they spend a lot of quality time and attention at those properties, they will probably manage them a little better than Kyle and I would because they have so much more time spent per unit than a, prof a professional property manager is going to have about 80 uh, units per employee. And if you're self, if you can do it yourself and you only have 10 or 20, you can spend more time per unit. Because of that, you're going to catch these little things. You can go in and fix a flush kit for free. Uh, versus paying our plumber, you know, seventy-eight-five dollars to go, re you know, replace a flush kit. So, but but you have to decide if that's your lifestyle, right? Like I personally, I didn't want to be the guy that owned ten houses, and I'm the guy changing the flush kit. I didn't want to do that. I knew that I had to achieve scale to reach my goals, but not everybody's goals uh, are the same. So if you if you're drawing out your financial plan and your financial plan is satisfied with ten houses, 
paid off by the time you reach age 55 or 60, whatever your goals are, if that works for you, that works for you. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. And you may, you very well may manage those properties cheaper and maybe even better than a professional property manager because of you're spending all that time there. Um, softwares, you know, when I first started, I used a spreadsheet as my software, but then once we hit a certain number of units, we looked at all the property management softwares out there and there's a lot of good ones. We use Appfolio, um, but it's expensive. You know, if you have 10 houses, you don't want to pay for Appfolio. Uh, one of the best pro uh, softwares for smaller portfolios is uh, Buildium. It's usually cheaper. Um, and if you have 10 to 25 houses, for example, 40 houses even, um, Buildium is a good software. Uh, there's a lot of them. And that's for the property management, the enterprise software, accounting software. Um, we have a local startup called Tenant Turner, which we use for uh, setting up showings. Uh, we use a software called Property Meld for dealing with maintenance. And uh, Tenant Turner and Property Meld and Appfolio are all pretty popular in the property management space. Um, last question here, would you completely renovate a property before renting it to a tenant? Um, there's no just one way to answer that question. The, 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 I think the correct way to answer that question is, is you should correctly renovate each rental based on the neighborhood and the quality of tenant, the type of tenant you're trying to attract. When Kyle was describing the type of backsplash he uses and the countertops he uses and the cabinets he uses, and he uses the same ones, that's because he's, he's buying rentals and he's appealing to the same type of tenant in each of those properties. So it's a great system to use. But if Kyle's paying, you know, call it 150 grand per rental and he's using these finishes, he wouldn't use those same finishes for a $300,000 rental. He probably wouldn't buy the $300,000 rental because it's hard to make the cash flow work, but you wouldn't use the same countertops at $150,000 rental as you would at a $75,000 rental, even probably, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, so I think one of the worst things you can do is under-renovate, and one of the worst things you can do is over-renovate uh, a rental. And and to truly know the answer to that question, you got to have sub-market expertise. You have to understand the tenants that are renting in that neighborhood and what they demand, what they expect, what they want, what they don't want in a rental. Um, and, and the only way to do that uh, is to hire someone good that knows, like a realtor or a property manager that knows, or you get that experience yourself by living and breathing uh, the game, by uh, showing the property yourself, talking to tenants, talking to tenants that are buying and, I'm sorry, that are renting, talking to tenants that are not renting and understanding why. Why are you moving out? Why are you moving in? What, what are you renting for over there? What are you willing to pay here? Um, that experience is, is very valuable. And once you get that submarket expertise, you have a leg up on everyone else that doesn't. Um, I think I hit all the bullet points. Uh, if you guys want to, you know, throw any more questions uh, at myself or Kyle, I'm sure he's, he's able to answer some more. Yeah, either, either of you can answer um, the questions. I do have um, two questions that has come up in the chat. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Can you guys, you can hear me? Um, so I have Miss uh, Byron Demetrius Russell who asked, uh, what area in Richmond do you think is hot right now? Uh, as get, far as I guess the rentals goes. You wanna go first, Kyle? Well, I mean, Scott, Scott's addition is, is in Fuego. <laughs> but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that's where you where you want to be because when it's hot it's pretty costly unless you unless you're in at the right price it's just it's higher risk but I mean Scott's addition and, and Manchester are just you got a lot of people putting a lot of money into those neighborhoods um yeah so if you're, so if, if, you're buying, if they're buying if they're buying single families Kyle like where would you buy single families today in in the in the city, well, I wouldn't buy in the city. Um, so it's hard because there are a lot of owners. So so for for rentals, you know, if you can find a deal in Eastern Henrico, I still would do Eastern Henrico. If you can find a deal uh, in the near West End, I'd I'd find it. You got to you got to get the numbers to work, you know. Uh, Falling Creek neighborhood of Chesterfield, but you you, you got to get the numbers to work, and they're hard to work right now. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Duke? All right, so she's asking, she's asking, um, you know, what are you thinking about Sandston and airport construction? Yeah, so yeah. Airport, like airport. I mean, I, Duke, you want to talk a little? Yeah, bit I, about I think we're on the same page. I think you know the like I always look on the fringe. You know, like what I mean by the fringe is that like. The north side has been a great example for the last, you know, 10, 15 years is that you've got, you got a house selling for 300,000, you know, two blocks that way. And then you got a house that's, uh, 
uh, been abandoned and you know in horrible shape two blocks that way um and so if you can buy at those prices and turn it into that uh that that's possible on the fringe and so you know to kyle's point the county works better for a long-term hold if you want a tenant's going to stay there five ten twenty years that, that's more likely there uh it's not impossible in the city but you know taxes are higher and there's some other there's other things that make it tough but I would say there's the fringe of the north side because there's still areas, pockets to be developed there. I think just east of the city, Fulton Hill, even in, you know, Highland Springs, Sandston, I think all those areas are fine. And there, there's like, you know, there, even like in the West End, like you look at like near near uh, Regency Mall, there's, you know, three bedroom, two bath ranchers uh, over there off of Parham, um, you know, Ridgecrest, all those, those streets over there. Um, there's parts of pockets of south, you know, North Chesterfield, just south of the city that have great rental opportunities. You know, the true, if you're asking the question, what is the hot neighborhoods? Kyle's right, like Scott's Edition, Manchester, but you're not going to buy a single family in Scott's Edition right now. Uh, you're, and it, you're probably not going to buy anything in Manchester that uh, not much in Manchester because it's owned by, you know, the Robin Millers of the world and all the people that own all the multifamily land. Um, so what Kyle was describing was a pretty, I think, a solid strategy looking on the fringe, the, the county, but the smaller houses in the county. Um, and I think I had two other areas they asked about, um, Colonial Heights and um, South Side of Richmond Future. I don't know um, who asked that question about the South Side. I think you got to elaborate on which, what you meant on that. Um, but they Jeff did, um, Davis? Jeff Davis? Yeah, off of Jeff Davis or further south? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think both. That's what they're saying, both. I think, I mean, I think Colonial Heights is a slight upgrade from Petersburg, but I still have some of the same fears. Like the Tri Cities areas in general, Hopewell, Petersburg, Colonial Heights. Yeah, you can find, you can find some pockets there of solid long term rentals, but um, I would think Chesterfield and Henrico would be a tad stronger. Right. And then um, I guess Jefferson Davis, Jeff, Jefferson Davis scares me, <laughs> maybe because I'm not from here, but um, yeah, it, it, it scares me a little. But um, so he's saying both Jefferson Davis and south of Richmond. That's what he said, south mm -hmm. of Richmond. So I read the question wrong, maybe. Yeah, I mean, Jefferson, I, go ahead. Jefferson Kyle, Davis you. is changing. Go, go ahead, Duke. I mean, yeah, no, you, I want to, you go first. I mean, we, we manage a lot of stuff off of Jeff Davis. Um, you're, I don't know if you're ever going to get that disproportionate appreciation that we talked about. Um, you know, there's some sound rentals over there, but, um, and it's, it's changing and it's probably the last, I think Fulton's developing more than Jeff Davis. So I would say that that's the last section of, Richmond for development and so Duke knows more about development than I do so yeah I would have to agree I, I would like I went before COVID and everything was booming everything so many neighborhoods in Richmond were, seemed to be clicking on all cylinders uh Jackson Ward Carver Churchill Scott's Edition Manchester all you know Oregon Hill all those neighborhoods were doing great um in the two parts of town that I saw con investors continue to try and fail were Chamberlain Avenue corridor and the Jeff Davis corridor um, and so I just think it's going to take longer, you know, those areas may improve and, uh, but it's going to take longer, um, bef before I think you can make money without, without risk. I mean, you're going to, you can probably buy property cheaper in those two pockets per unit than anywhere else, but there's the risk of vacancy and risk of bad debt that go with it that you have to be, you know, aware of. So I'd say just go into those areas with your eyes open and be willing to, if you're willing to take that risk and hold for a while, so it's going to be a while before, uh, they do appreciate it. All right. Um, I do have another question for you guys. Um, oh, let me scroll up. It says, what are the new laws concerning tenant notifications? Are you guys able to um, give a few laws um, concerning tenant notifications? I guess, um, you know, what? You know you guys, whoever wants to elaborate on their question. Yeah. Um, Give us a little more, or I'm not sure if they're talking about like anything COVID related or if they're talking some other laws. I, I, I need a little more um, clarity. Who asked the question? I mean, it, until they elaborate, is it okay for you guys to answer as far as the, um, you know, COVID goes? 
what are the new laws um you're muted surrounding Kyle. COVID. No, yeah, no, I mean, you can talk a I minute. Mean, it's just, it's really, it's just about what, what your, what your loan is really is the, the only thing about it as far as, um, well, you know, the, the question is, what are you going to do around maintenance? Does the tenant allow you to come in and work on the, on, on your stuff? What should, you know, you know, so what, what should your technicians do? What are your practices and policies around social distancing? Um, what are your policies around asking that tenant if they have been ill, if they've had a fever? Um, uh, are you allowed to evict? Are you allowed to send pay or quits? Are you allowed to charge late fees at this point? Um, I mean, I, Duke, I mean, you want to talk? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, when COVID yeah. hit, like we had to scramble and learn really quickly what we should do and shouldn't do. And so for the most part across the board, you know, we weren't charging late fees. We weren't filing pay or quits. We're asking tenants really nicely to please pay rent, remind them that we want to, we can set up payment plans, but we also want to try to keep you on track this month because whenever this ends, you know, whenever the courts open back up, you know, when that day comes, you don't want to have a big balance. And so we ask, you know, and most tenants did, but some didn't, and some are going to come out of this with a huge balance. And then you have to decide what are you going to do then? Are you going to evict them or are you let, allow them to pay the rent plus 20% or something like that to catch up? And for us, because we're third party property managers, we work, you know, we let the, we work with the owner and the tenant to try to work out a payment plan that works. But um, as far as notifications and, you know, we, a lot of tenants, if they have a maintenance issue, if it's not an emergency, they're waiting till this is over, whenever this is over to uh, let us come fix it. If it's emergency, we're coming to fix it. Some tenants were asking them to, vacate the premises while we're there. So the technician and the tenant are both safe, but you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a touchy subject. And I think everyone out there is just trying their best to, to survive and get through it. Um, and so we're trying our best. I'm not sure if we answered that question, but we tried. <laughs> I, you know, one of the comments that Duke made earlier, and it was interesting because it, 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 it hit a, it, 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 it hit me was the, um, is when you have a property management company managing your property, a lot of times that tenant can create emotion that really is not, that would make you do something that really isn't a sound business decision. And so one of the things that when you're a little bit removed and, and I'll say personally, you know, if a tenant um, wants a $100 credit, because they didn't have hot water over the weekend. And you're kind of like, well, the timeout, you know, it, you know, it was only 12 hours or it was only this. And you sit there and you think, well, or I bent over backwards to respond. And you, you get emotional about it because, you know, you're, you're emotionally invested if you're an individual owner in that. A lot of times it just makes sense to give them that hundred bucks and to be done with it. And you won't even remember that hundred bucks as an owner two two months from now. So sometimes I will say that if you're, if you're very invested or emotionally invested into these tenants, they will make you do things that you really shouldn't do. And so as a property manager, when it's, when it's not really your money, you can sometimes say, all right, the right business decision is this. And so um, I will tell you again, personally, I, I go through that if I, if I own something and, and for some reason I find out about a complaint that I'm like, this is completely, you know, crap, bull crap. And uh, so, so I try to stay removed so that I don't emotionally do something that's just silly. Like, oh, no, don't give them a nickel. If they really, that's all they want is a nickel. Um, so anyway, I just, I want to bring that up because that is something that I think helps. Uh, I don't know, Duke, would you agree? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, mo I would say most humans aren't cut out to be landlords because it's hard, it's challenging and you get challenged by, uh, you know, if you have a hundred tenants, there's going to be seven tenants in there that are just not nice people that are, will manipulate you, will, uh, lie to you and, and, most people aren't used to that and they can get, they can get emotional. Um, they can get upset. Uh, most, you know, most of our landlords, uh, some landlords use us because they don't know what they're doing. Some landlords use us because they need that separation between us, the, them and the tenant to make good business decisions or 
uh, to just not have to worry about, not to worry, you know, like if you treat it like if you can hire a property manager, you can treat it like a business. You get your monthly reports, you respond to us with emergencies. Otherwise, we take care of business. You, you get your statement and you're checking into the month. And a lot of people appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a tough business. Like, I think that's the thing that when I got into it, I never expected. Because I like people and I assume all people are good and honest. And um, you get into this business, you realize that not everybody is. And on top of that, financial stress will make a lot of people do bad things on the landlord side and the tenant side. Financial stress will, will, will bring out the worst in people. And there's nothing more stressful than you lost your job and you can't pay the rent or there's nothing more stressful than your tenant's not paying rent and yeah, you got to pay a mortgage. And so you'll see, you'll see people's true colors, which sometimes aren't pretty. So yeah, it's, it's not for the meek, you know, you can still treat people well and, and treat people with respect and, uh, and all that, but you, but you have to deal with some of the, the ugliness of, uh, of the, of humans. Right. So we have one last question and we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, we have this question from Facebook and it actually runs right into what you guys were just, was just saying. Um, they asked, what is the average cost for a property management company? I'm, I'm, we're 5% cheaper than Kyle. So I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, mean, I, I would say, you know, it's different on the, depending on the property type and something like that. I, I would, you know, I think most property management companies are around eight to 10% management fee. Sometimes there's other fees on top of that, like a leasing fee or a renewal fee. But, you know, if you ask across the industry, they're usually in that range. Kyle, is that is that the politically correct answer? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For, for whatever reason. I um, yeah, I, I, I'd say it's, I'm going to say actually between 8 and 12%. I think that the deal is just feel comfortable who, who, who you're working with and understand, um, you know, there are other costs. I mean, that that's the, the management company. I mean, this is this is the pitch. You know, I mean, the management company, that's one fee, but you got, you really should think about spending an extra two. We use the, 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 um, the ratio of $200 per month per property you should accrue for repairs on the property. Um, so you have that, you got, you know, insurance stuff. So I always just say, you know, just make sure you feel comfortable with whomever you're working with, because at the end of the day, if they're an extra $500 a year or they're $500 cheaper, you got to just feel comfortable. That, that's, that's what I tell people. You got to have a good relationship with that management company and trust they're, they're, they got your back. Yeah, it's one of the businesses, and I think Kyle would agree, you get what you pay for in this business. The cheaper guy cheapest guy on the block is probably not the guy you want. You know, you might not want the most expensive either, but you want the most value. But uh, the, a bad property manager will cost you a lot more than $500 a year to Kyle's point. Like, uh, so, you know, take your time and interview with a couple of folks and get, you know, make a decision that you're comfortable with. The other, what, and I'm going to make, when it comes, you know, it's interesting. You said, hey, try a property management company first. Duke, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. Sometimes we tell people, hey, try to do it on your own for, you know, for a little bit because if you try to do it on your own you you're you will get into trouble and but then you'll know did i just lose you or you just bounced down somewhere else um you, you try to do it on your own then you're going to really appreciate what a property management company does for you you know once something goes sideways you still there duke he did bounce off. I was literally just going to ask him for his contact information as well. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure he will be back on. But again, we want to thank you guys so much. Um, it says he's still here, but I think he just dropped off in some kind of way. Um, but we want to thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to try and wait for Duke to come back so that we can get there he is. There he is. There he is. Um, Duke, if you can just um, share your contact information with us. Sure. Our website is dotsonpm.com. You can find us on Facebook at Dotson Property Management as well. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So we thank you guys so much for joining Thanks. us. You guys gave us so Dude, much Good to see you, man. Be safe, brother. Thanks, Kyle. Always a All pleasure. So Thanks, much guys. Y'all right. have All a good right. night. Take care. You guys too. And for everyone else, um, again, we do want to thank you guys for joining us tonight. If Whoever wants to leave, you can go ahead and drop off. You'll probably still catch this meeting on Facebook. <laughs> um, but yes, so we thank you guys so much for um, joining us tonight. 
Um, we do have um, our June meeting. Again, we want you guys to sign up. Um, this, this meeting is completely community-based. We want to hear from you guys. We want to hear what your experience is. And we want to hear if you guys have any um, ideas that you can give us, any pointers or anything. Um, we just thank you guys so much for joining us. Again, we are a deal-based organization. So if you guys have any deals, we want you guys to go ahead and um, present those deals to us. You can um, add them in our Facebook meeting group. Um, am I forgetting anything, Uwe? I think that's pretty much it. Uh, you um, had everything on the, on the dot, so. Well, perfect. So we're going to go ahead and let you guys go for the night again. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you here um, for our networking meeting. All right.